Traditionally, the workplace hasn't been a safe place to share a mental health diagnosis. Recently, though, I've seen more people going public with their diagnosis. The big challenge is, how do you know if it is safe to share? I went public with my bipolar type 1 diagnosis by listening to my peers' experiences in the mental health recovery community. Today, seven of my peers will anonymously share their experiences to help you understand my decision to go public at work. I'm Seth. I'm a pastor, and I've been open about my bipolar type 1 diagnosis with my congregation, the bishop's office, my community, the local media, and the broader denomination. This video features real comments from real people in online bipolar communities that I participate in. They are anonymous to protect their privacy, but their words are still powerful. So please comment or ask questions, or you can email me at seth at ourstigma.com. That's Seth at ourstigma.com if you prefer to remain anonymous. And at the end of this video, I'm going to share with you the two most important takeaways that I've learned since speaking openly about my diagnosis. So let's begin. Comment number one. I've never shared my diagnosis. I've told four people. This is the reality that I lived in. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell anybody at work. I didn't tell anyone at school. I really kept it private. I was 17 years old. Like that was when I was first diagnosed. So I really felt uncomfortable in all social circumstances. And the only people that knew were my close family. And my family really didn't even talk about it too much. Something that I really struggled with was having to justify what I did how I acted, how I spoke, my mannerisms, my behavior, why I stutter sometimes, why it's difficult sometimes to concentrate and think. So for this person who never shared their diagnosis, I have to say that it is a powerful option. It is an option that everyone should be comfortable taking. So when thinking about people who are clergy and pastors specifically, no one should feel pressured to disclose their diagnosis. With that said, I believe that employers should create environments that are safe for individuals who have mental health conditions like bipolar disorder or other people who fall under the umbrella of neurodiversity. Comment number two, if you mention the psych ward, I often get questions like, is it like Shutter Island? Were you together with crazy people? I'm gonna go into a story about this. Before I was a pastor, I worked as a comedian and I had some very public manic episodes. I had about three of them when I was in the comedy scene. So what happened was after my first manic episode in that stand-up comedy scene, I felt like I just wasn't supported by other people. And after my second manic episode, which actually happened when I was on the road, I found out that people were taking bets on whether or not I would have a manic episode while I was on tour and it happened. And then when I got out of the hospital and I went back to doing stand-up comedy, I got brought up on stage as a comedian who had just gotten out of the psych ward and it threw me through a loop. I didn't know how to begin my act. I didn't know how to get back on my feet. And I was really, that was my first set back at a major club. There was 200 people in the club and uh, I, I just felt horrible, right? So my point is, I don't think people really truly understand what psych wards are what the purpose of a psych ward is, and every time that I have mentioned it in a work environment, both stand up and even being open as a pastor, I get these quizzical looks and most people truly don't understand. They do think of things like Shutter Island or One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. My experience in psych wards has been incredibly varied. There are places that are really therapeutic. There are other places that are incredibly institutional. They all serve a purpose and really in my life, they have served me to get back onto the road to health. So I guess my main point is in a work environment and especially for me working in a church, there is a lack of education about what psychiatric units are actually like and what their purpose is. Comment number three, I was asked, do you work at a large corporation that has a robust HR protection and modern values or something different? in the US? So the short answer is I don't. I don't have much in the way of protection or HR. 
the way that things are run for me as a pastor are incredibly informal. And like I'll say later in the video, things are inconsistent from church to church to church in my denomination. While I didn't think that I was at risk, I knew that my life was going to change. Later, I'm going to talk about what it would be like for some other people in different circumstances. But for me, I was pretty confident that I would get support. Comment number four. Am I open at work? Nope. It will never come up. I am a champion at avoiding personal conversations at work. I work in corporate America, and it can get weird. Authenticity is not really expected or protected, so I am going to sit right here and talk about the weather or whatever professional sport happened over the weekend. So I'll have to say this about my experience. When I made the decision about a year and a half ago, to go public with my mental health diagnosis at church as a pastor, as the solo pastor at my congregation, I knew that I was stepping over a threshold that I'll never be able to reverse. The toothpaste was completely out of the tube, and I, I knew that that was going to happen. And I knew that I was doing that maybe to educate people and to kind of free people of uh, the stigma of mental health. But the most important thing that this comment says is authenticity is not expected, but the best part of it is authenticity is not protected. I knew that there was not a guarantee that my quote unquote authenticity was going to be protected by anything. I knew that there was a remote chance that my job technically could be at danger down the road. I also knew that there could be immense misunderstandings. And I'll say this, I do mental health recovery education seminars with people. And when I finish speaking, people come up to me and I speak to a lot of former clergy and they say, I have had discrimination in the past, 10 years, 15 years, 25 years, 30 years ago. And they can say that it comes from higher ups, council, like the church council that handles the governance of the church and even the bishop's office. That definitely is still a reality for many people. And I have to say that now. It is a reality for many people. I may be an outlier. I have seen colleagues go through things that I doubt I would ever face. Comment five. Most people in my life are aware of my bipolar disorder, PTSD, and my autism. I do it to advocate for mental illness and awareness. And despite my issues, I'm a normal human being otherwise. Going public, especially on my Facebook, has inspired a lot of people to be open with me about their mental health. People have messaged me personally, thanking me for making posts. It has also connected me with others in my community who also are challenged with bipolar disorder. I thought going public was going to completely reduce the stigma, maybe even get rid of the stigma of my diagnosis. What it did was, in many ways, amplify it. I saw it everywhere, every day, all the time. And so this was both a good experience and a bad experience. It was bad because it seemed to me that that was all that people really wanted to talk to me about. But I had other things to do at work as a pastor. But it was good because I knew that people who needed help were coming to me and I could refer them out places to get that help. And also that I was a person that people could just feel comfortable talking with. Comment number six. I'd like to be more open about it, but the stigma against bipolar in my profession is very, very strong. And people say pretty wild things all the time. It's getting better as younger people come in, but still the risk of being ostracized feels very high. So here's the problem. I want to be open about my mental health condition, but I know that there's people out there that are going to see me in a different light. That's something that really I've taken on since I've gone public. I have worried about other people's perception as I am in conversation with them. I'm wondering, are they thinking that I'm okay? People are asking me, hey, Seth, are you okay? Well, that's a normal question for people to ask sometimes, to ask me if I'm okay. Other times, people ask the question, are you okay? Because they think you are not okay, that you have shown signs that you are not okay. So I've tried to have more specific and intentional discussions around that. If I wasn't in a healthy work environment, I think that things would be very different. Comment seven. When I was diagnosed 13 years ago, it didn't seem as commonly discussed. I think people are much more familiar with bipolar now, and I work with people who have general anxiety, 
ADHD, and someone who has been diagnosed with multiple personality disorder. Some friends are diabetic. I have bipolar too. This is the way I look at it. Okay, so I have a little bit of baggage around the whole diabetic comparison thing. So yes, I take medication every day for my bipolar disorder. Yes, it works, it helps. I see a doctor about it. There are certainly some parallels, but I was first told that whole diabetic analogy when I was 17 years old, when I first got diagnosed. Doctors, counselors, friends, they all said, in many ways, it's like diabetes. You got to take pills every day and it'll make you feel better, right? And uh, here's why it never worked for me. I never saw a diabetic go manic. I never saw a diabetic become delusional. I never saw a diabetic have audio hallucinations. I never saw a diabetic not able to sleep for six days in a row. And I never saw a diabetic destroy all of their family relationships because of the behavior that was emanating from their own mind. So this brings up my main point for this comment. I still think it is early days. We are still trying to figure out how to talk about mental health and neurodiversity and all these things that people live well with. I don't have all the solutions, but I hope to contribute a little bit here and there. Here are my takeaways. First, I only recently learned this and it's been eye-opening. Framing my decision to go public with my diagnosis as quote-unquote brave may not be helpful to those who choose to keep their diagnosis private. Keeping a diagnosis private makes a person no less brave than I. My reason for going public had to do with the perfect scenario arising for me. I had the right congregation, I had the support of the bishop's office, I felt safe, and I knew that I wasn't in danger of losing my job, my position, my career in any way. Other pastors, other professionals, other people may not have my scenario, may not have my privilege. And my final takeaway is this. I have to try and stay humble. I have to try and keep grounded. I have to make sure that this doesn't take over my personality. What I've done is nothing new. There are hundreds of other YouTubers making content about bipolar disorder. There are thousands of other clergy talking about their mental health. There are even more bloggers that do the same thing. And most do it better than I. My decision to be open, it wasn't reinventing the wheel by any means. So if what I said is interesting, comment, definitely. But if you want to know more, watch this.